Hey everybody, welcome back to RPG Imaginings. I was conversing with my few number of patrons on Patreon and I asked them what they wanted me to do next for a video and I gave them a choice between either me describing what I'm doing to prep for the Children of Fear campaign that I'm going to be running for my group or whether or not they'd be more interested in me doing a playthrough of Alone Against the Tide and it was pretty much unanimous that Alone Against the Tide was the vote. I should probably mention that this is a sponsored video. This video is sponsored by Chaosium. Thank you Chaosium for the sponsorship. Uh, I had purchased the PDF of Alone Against the Tide when it was released as an official Chaosium release some sometime uh, at the end of last year, at the end of 2020, and it uh, this is kind of an auspicious timing for doing this uh, beginning of a playthrough because it was just announced today by the official Chaosium Twitter account that Alone Against the Tide is now available in all five warehouses worldwide. And so the good news is, is that if you're viewing this in, you know, most uh, countries, this is now warehoused and you can get a physical copy if you want a physical copy. So I had purchased the PDF months and months and months ago and Chaosium sent this physical copy to me a couple of weeks ago. And what I'm going to do here is I just want to give an, a general overview of solitaire adventures for Call of Cthulhu, because this is something that Call of Cthulhu has historically done very well. And But there's a lot of variation of the solitaire adventures that exist out there for Call of Cthulhu, both in length and difficulty. And so I wanted to start out here with just sort of a description of what's going on with Alone Against the Tide and how does it compare to some of the other solitaire adventures that are out there. So if I've counted them correctly, there are four solitaire adventures for Call of Cthulhu. There is Alone Against the Flames, which is currently available in print in the Call of Cthulhu starter set, although I think that you can get a copy of it, a PDF copy of it for free as well. And that is an example of a shorter solitaire scenario that does not take very long to play through. We also have... Um, Alone Against the Frost, which is an update of the old Alone Against the Wendigo. And Alone Against the Frost takes place in uh, the northeastern United States. And it is kind of a frontier scenario. And uh, then we also have Alone Against the dark and alone against the dark is a long-standing solitaire scenario and alone against the dark uh, is a world travel scenario and in terms of complexity i would definitely say that alone against the dark is by far the most complex out of all the solitaire adventures because it involves you carefully tracking time and writing down the number of days that you have and there is a time limit for you to to accomplish certain goals and there's basically just a ton of bookkeeping involved in Alone Against the Dark, but it is still a super fun scenario if you really like the nitty gritty of tracking the amount of time that you have in, in the day and that you can't visit all of the locations because you'll run out of time. Then I would kind of put Alone Against the Frost and Alone Against the Tide on sort of the same level in terms of their complexity. And uh, then Alone Against the Flames is by far the least complex out of all of them. I think all of these solitaire adventures are difficult. Like, I can count on a single hand the number of times that I've won, quote unquote, or had a successful end to one of these solitaire adventures. And I've played all four of them over and over and over again. They are really challenging. And, you know, that is, I think, part of the appeal to them, that if you really want to challenge yourself, uh, these scenarios are challenging if played by the book. But just like any Call of Cthulhu adventure, you can sort of decide where you stretch the rules and, and where you don't stretch the rules. And, you know, sometimes I metagame them if, if I really feel like, you know, I want to see what, what's coming up next rather than starting the whole thing over. And so, you know, your game will vary as always. And so what we're going to do here with Alone Against the Tide is that this is going to sort of be uh, an introductory video for the rest of the video in which we're going to sort of do the setup and we'll probably sort of get a little bit into the story, but then I will finish up the video here with posing a question to everybody in the audience, and you can suggest, you know, what I do next, 
and uh, I will be using the is one of the established investigators for this product. You know, I should probably say some things about Alone Against the Tide because Nicholas Johnson, I think, has really produced one of the most mature, and I don't mean mature, you know, in terms of... Uh, uh, themes or anything like that mature in terms of gaming mature as in most developed solitaire adventures for call of cthulhu that is out there in the history of this if i understand it correctly just a couple of years ago nicholas johnson uh, published this on the Miskatonic repository and it was so well received and so good that Chaosium decided to market for development as an official product. And this is the official product release of that scenario alone against the tide. I also think, cause I've, I've played through this before. I'll just give you a, a little, um, here's the notes that I took for my first playthrough. Like I'm sort of, you know, marking down everything as we go along and what choices I made. And this can be really useful in doing these solitaire scenarios because if you lose your place, you can always look back at your notes and figure out where you came from. And uh, so, yeah, I got pretty far in this uh, playthrough before, in this particular instance, I was killed, okay? <laughs> um, and, you know, just like any other Call of Cthulhu scenario, you can be killed or, or go insane. You know, there's all sorts of things that can happen here. I should probably also mention here that you do have some flexibility and that you could use your own investigator. You could, uh, you have some freedom at the beginning to choose skills and the adventure gives you, uh, scenario gives you an indication of maybe what skills are going to be more useful in the adventure. So let's just go ahead and turn the page and dive right in. And I'm going to go ahead and do what I normally wouldn't do, uh, you know, for a book like this is fold down the pages so that we can really get it displayed well on the screen. Um, Lynn Hardy and Mike Mason were both involved with the editorial on this. And uh, there's some great artwork in here, but let's just go ahead and dive right in. And when we get to reading the actual entries here, what I will probably do is use the PDF and post those entries, blow them up on the screen. But for just reading the introduction and getting started, I'm just going to you know read through as we go along. So once again, I am using the uh, included investigator Eleanor Woods and this is included she is included at the back of the book you basically choose between uh, a male or female version of the same static investigator so we have Eleanor Woods right here I printed the character sheet off from the PDF or we have Ellery Woods and they are both professors they have identical stats and backstories um, you know you could make the character non-binary if you want whatever you want to do with it there's total freedom for you to do that and so let's go ahead and dive right into Alone Against the Tide Alone Against the Tide is a solo adventure for the Call of Cthulhu role playing game unlike a standard game of Call of Cthulhu this adventure requires no keeper as it is a solo scenario in fact you are both the keeper and the story's main character you can take on the role of an investigator of your own design, or if you prefer, one of the two ready-to-play investigators provided, Dr. Ellery Woods or Dr. Eleanor Woods, I will be playing the, uh, the second. So, depending upon the investigator you play, your reasons for traveling to the quiet, affluent lakeside town in which the adventure is set may vary. The horrors your character experiences and how much of the mystery affecting Esbury you manage to solve depend on your choices throughout the game. These choices not only affect what happens to your investigator, but also the other people you meet along the way. For all its scenic beauty and charm, Esbury is a dangerous place, and there is every chance that your investigator could die as the events of Alone Against the Tide unfold. Thankfully, though, you can attempt this scenario as many times as you want to. You can also choose a different investigator or create a new one each time you play to help you explore the various challenges and pathways the story has to offer. So what are you waiting for? Esbury's fate is in your hands. And there's a nice little preparing to start box right here. You obviously need dice in order to play the game. You should also have a copy of the Call of Cthulhu Keeper rule book or the Call of Cthulhu starter set. This is true for all of the solo scenarios out there, except for Alone Against the Flames. Um, you, I think you can play that one without the rules because the idea behind Alone Against the Flames is that it teaches you the rules of 7th edition. So, you know, get a copy of your character sheet, um, read the getting started section, which we are about to do. And once that's done, you're ready to rely to take on the challenges starting on page eight. So let's read the getting started section. Before you begin play, you will need a set of role-playing dice, check, a pencil, 
I'll be using IJ Instruments Model 9. This is a machined uh, mechanical pencil that is on the top of my mechanical pencils right now. It's very much after the Pentel P200 series, but machined out of metal. I love it. Um, and an eraser that's on top. As mentioned in preparing to start, you will also need a copy of either Call of Cthulhu Keeper Rulebook or the Call of Cthulhu Starter Set in your investigator sheet. This adventure is designed to lead you through the basic rules of character creation in Call of Cthulhu as you play. You'll be directed to them by the text once you start the scenario. Of course, if you're using a pre-generated investigator, just ignore the comments in the text about creating a new character. We will be ignoring those comments. If you'd prefer not to create your own investigator, a male and female variant of the same ready-to-play character, Dr. E. Woods, is included at the end of the scenario. Page 78 through 82, note that only certain skills have already been allocated points. You have a pool of 70 bonus skill points to spend on any skills. For Dr. Woods, this can include increasing those skills already allocated points or choosing other skills to broaden out Dr. Woods' abilities. Just add to the bonus skill points, divide it up however you wish, to the base skill values, you know, no, like we normally do, would for Call of Cthulhu. And so it gives you an example of how to do that. But basically, you know, if you if you want to add 20 points to jump, Jump's base level is 10, so 20 plus 10 is 30. Um, this is the most important part, though. As a guide, the following skills could be useful. Anthropology, appraise, archaeology, charm, climb, fast talk, fighting brawl, firearms, handgun, intimidate, jump, listen, locksmith, navigate, persuade, psychology, spot hidden, stealth, survival, and swim. So let's take a look at Eleanor Woods, and I have 70 points available, and so we'll just sort of mark a 70 down here on the sides so we can decide what to do with this. Okay, well, first off, we have a glaring omission here. We have spot hidden with no additional skill points in it. And so I'm just going to go ahead and mark spot hidden as a possibility for improvement there. Um, it was also recommended stealth and swim. I'm just going to go ahead. Some of you might call this metagaming. Okay. But this is alone against the tide and there's a very clear water theme for this. So I'm just going to assume that some skill points in you know, swim would be useful. Um, and, uh, let's look at the rest of the list. Um, persuade, we have at 40 and we don't have any other social skill. You know, I like to have really strong social skills in Call of Cthulhu. So that might be a candidate. And what else do we want to do? Our fighting brawl is pretty good at 45. Firearms at 40. Yeah, I, I prefer to solve my issues in Call of Cthulhu more from academic skills. And so, you know, maybe we'll go with a praise. Okay, so I've starred five of these. I'm not going to increase five of them because I want to be, you know, pretty decent at some of these. And so my gut is telling me I'm going to put 20 in swim. So we're going to make this a 40, so our half value is 20, and our fifth value is 8. Yes, I have many of these memorized, but, you know, we can also take clues uh, from math from the rest of the character sheet in order to do that. So we are down to 50 available skill points. Um, spot hidden at 25. What are you, what are you, crazy? Okay. <laughs> um, gosh, what do I want to do here? I'm going to go ahead and put 20 in spot hidden. Okay, that'll bring me down to 30 left, 25 plus 20, whoops, so I should be adding here, 25 plus 20 is 45, and you know, we can use context clues, here's another 45 for fighting, fighting brawl, so that's 22 and 9, okay, I have 30 points left, I'm sort of feeling that I want to like maybe split those up between two sections, and so I think I'm going to go with uh, stealth, Okay, I'm going to add 15 to stealth, making it a 35. And half of 35 is 17. And one-fifth of 35 is 7. Okay, and so I have 15 points remaining. Where do I want to put that? So out of the ones that I starred, the ones that I have remaining are persuade and appraise. I already have a persuade at 40, but persuading people could be very useful. I don't have anything in appraise. And if I'm a professor, you know, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I do want something in a, in a praise. I mean, a 20% chance isn't going to be terribly good, but it's going to be better than 5%. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in a praise, giving me 20, half value of 10, fifth value is four. And there we go. I have spent my 70 skill points. Okay. What's next? 
Allocate the 70 bonus skill points wherever you want. Of course, you'll have to pick which skills you think are going to be useful. That's part of the game. You won't have enough skill points to always pass your skill rolls, but that's where luck points can come in very handy. And so we're going to turn the page to page six, okay? Oh, I should just point out this asterisk probably that you can download uh, writable PDF sheets for both variants of these characters at chaosium.com if you, you know, rather have these numbers nice and, and typed in, okay? Reading this book. As this is a solo adventure, you don't read this book in the same way you would a standard role-playing scenario. That is, you don't read it through from beginning to end. If you do, not only will it be very confusing, but it will also spoil the surprises lying in wait for you. Another difference is that the book isn't split into chapters, but into separate entries. Each entry is numbered, and at its end can be found instructions for where to go and what to read next. You may have to make a choice or attempt a skill roll to see what happens. Occasionally, you may be asked to record something on your investigator sheet that you'll need to refer to later in the game. If you reach the relevant entry, you'll be prompted where to go next based on what you wrote. Don't carry these notes over to subsequent playthroughs. Every investigator must discover Esbury's secrets for themselves. So there should be, you know, like a fog of war between your play sessions. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be, you should try to avoid metagaming as much as possible. So this is essentially choose your own adventure, right? So some of you in the eighties, if you're familiar with choose your own adventure books where you'd buy a book and they would be themed in different ways, same idea. Okay. Note about the rules, bonus and penalty dice. Depending upon the situation, some entries instruct you to add either a bonus or a penalty die to your roll. If you are awarded a bonus die, roll an extra tens die alongside your usual percentile dice. When making the skill roll and take the best, lowest result, if you're assigned a penalty die, you also roll an additional tens die, but this time you take the worst, highest results. For more information on bonus and penalty die, you can check out the rules. And then combat. Combat in Alone Against the Tide has been simplified so that there are no opposed rolls. If Combat is an option open to your investigator. The entry will tell you what skill roll to make and what the level of difficulty is for that roll. Hard success only at equal to or below half of the skills value or extreme success only at equal to below one fifth of the skills value. If no difficulty level is stated, the roll is a regular one success at equal to or below the skills value. Certain non-combat skill roles may also be at harder extreme difficulty. For more info on difficulty levels, read the rules. Any damage your investigator suffers from taking part in combat is listed in the entry. Roll the damage die indicated to determine how many hit points <clears throat> they lose as a result of their injury. There are also some non-combat situations where your investigator may take damage again. Roll the damage die indicated, etc., etc. How about using luck points? <laughs> we will definitely be using luck points. And folks, I highly recommend that you use luck points uh, for these adventures because, uh, well, I think that there's a really good effort made by the authors, you know, to try to avoid sort of like the gotcha moments that were common in role playing of the past. Those can still exist here and luck can pretty much sometimes be the difference between you spending 45 minutes on something and having to restart and you not, you know? Um, so we recommend that you use the actual spending luck rule when playing through alone against the tide. For those using Call of Cthulhu starter set, this rule allows you to spend your luck points to alter the result of skill or characteristic roles. You may alter a role on a one for one basis with any spent luck points deducted from your current luck total. And it basically describes how to use luck. We know how to use luck here. So to work out how much luck your investigator has at the end of character creation, roll 3d6 and multiply the result times five. That is your luck score, which is pretty much the common method. And so here I'm using uh, my Elder Dice, my Cthulhu Elder Dice. This was a Kickstarter that completed a little over a year ago. I don't remember exactly when it was. And so for my D6s, I will be using these Cthulhu Dice. And so let's go ahead and give them a roll and see what we get for luck. And we got a 4, a 4, and a 1. 8 plus 1 is 9. And uh, 9 times five is 45. So, you know, pretty close to average. So our luck is 45. I'm going to go ahead and circle it right there on our character sheet. Not too bad. Not too shabby. Ah, uh, yep, we did that. Uh, while you may spend your investigator's luck points to succeed at a failed skill or characteristic roles, there will be no opportunity to improve your luck store score during your visit. And be aware, they may be called upon to make a luck roll at some point during the adventure. So you should try to make the best use of your character investigator's luck that you can. Remember, a luck roll is based on your investigator's current luck score, not their starting one. And this is probably the smallest part of the luck mechanic, in my opinion, in that if it was just points that you could spend, people would just, you know, 
drop the points without thinking about it. But given that luck rolls are a thing in the game, it's you, you sort of have to balance whether it's appropriate for you to make a roll of success or whether it's appropriate for you to for you to be more likely to succeed at a particular lucky situation that comes up, okay? What's different about insanity? Physical damage is not the only danger your investigator faces. Several encounters may challenge their sanity as well. In Alone Against the Tide, there are only two states of insanity, temporary and permanent. Treat any indefinite insanity result as temporary insanity. If your investigator goes temporarily insane, the entry will tell you what to do next. Follow these instructions rather than using the standard rules for a bout of madness. This scenario doesn't make you of phobias or mania, so ignore them. Should your investigator go permanently insane, redu reduce to zero sanity points, then they are out of the game. They either die in a manner appropriate to the situation that caused the permanent sanity, or they run off into the woods and hills around Esperi, never to be seen or heard from again. You may begin the adventure afresh, creating a new investigator to see if you can uncover more about the strange goings on in the benighted lakeshore town. How do we get started? Well, note about entries. Entries are numbered consecutively from 1 to 243. All entries present information in the same way. The entry number is in large, bold numerals. Details describe the scene or briefly comment on the situation. After that, the entry might instruct you to go to a certain entry or ask you to choose an action or to roll a die, which have different outcomes. The parenthesized number or numbers at the end of each entry are trace numbers showing the entries from which you may have come in order to have arrived at the present entry, These thus allowing you... Sorry, these allowing you to backtrack if necessary. Occasionally you encounter the phrase, the end. This signifies that your investigator is doomed and the adventure is over. Sometimes it means you have won, of course. If you failed in this attempt, you may always try again. Heck, you can try again even if you succeed. In fact, you know, sometimes it's just fun in these adventures discovering what crazy ways you can die or go insane. That's another aspect of it. So... Our story begins sometime in the 1920s on the pier opposite the lakeside resort town of Esbury, Massachusetts. Your investigator's reasons for visiting the town are discussed in the relevant entries. Read through the introduction and getting started sections and gather everything you need. Then when you are ready to begin playing, go to number one. Well, I have my Malachite dice right here. These were a gift from one of my players. They are my favorite uh, percentile dice set. And so I'll be using these. So we got our dice ready to go. And of course, I have other dice as well. Um, got my character sheet and I'm going to be trying to blow up the text here with images as, so it makes it a little easier for you to read along. We're already at 22 minutes in the video, so I'm probably not going to get too deep into the adventure. This is sort of like our introduction and planning video, but in later videos, you know, we'll, we'll see how far it goes. I'm not expecting it to go terribly far. Maybe we'll have a, we'll, we'll probably, we'll definitely have a second video. Maybe we'll have a third video. Maybe we'll have a first, fourth video. Who knows? We'll find out, right? So, number one, the sun sinks low on the horizon as you board the ferry headed across the lake to Esbury. As you set foot on the boat, the ferryman greets you with a wide smile and cheery wave. He stands by the gangplank as you pass, welcoming the other passengers as he removes his cap to scratch at his balding head. His pudgy figure fills his well-worn suit. He looks a little awkward, but he seems a rather pleasant sort. Leaving the man behind, you take a seat toward the prow, eyes fixed on your destination. Go to 12. We are choosing our own adventure here. 12. <clears throat> You settle into a seat with your thin briefcase resting on your lap, noticing that the rest of the, your passengers are likewise getting comfortable for the short trip across the lake. Glancing around, you catch sight of the ferryman entering the cabin. As you sit patiently and wait for the engine to come to life, you listen to the sounds of idle chatter around you. You look out across the water and notice a thin fog beginning to form over the surface of the water as the temperature drops with the approach of night. After a few minutes, you hear the engine sputter into action and feel the ferry lurch forward. The conversations around you continue as the ferryman joins you all on deck. You can't help overhearing most of the talk, though it's surprisingly banal. There are almost a dozen passengers on the ferry. Most of them are simply looking to spend their money during the weekend in Esbury and to enjoy the various shops and leisure activities the lakeside town has to offer. Many of the passengers seem to come for money, as is common in Esbury. You notice a strange look from one of the women in the group. She has a full figure and brown hair and eyes. She seems to be looking you over, admiring your features. There's a section here that talks about if you're creating your own investigator, which we're not doing, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip it. Although, you know, for those of you in the know... 
it uses the standard uh, characteristic set for Call of Cthulhu 7th edition. If you are using the pre-generated investigator, Dr. Woods, check. Take a look at how their characteristics have been assigned. The half and fifth values have already been calculated for you. If you need more information about what these characteristics mean, consult the rules, okay? So the characteristics are the same for both characters. Notice that we are professors, so we have a really high education score. We have a high intelligence score and then pretty average, you know, uh, for the rest of the characteristics. Um, con and dex are a little bit higher, but strength, size, pow, all, you know, average values of 50. Okie dokie. Go to 80. We're gonna turn to 80. Here it is, 80. The woman clearly sees something in, the, in you that she likes. Perhaps it's your looks or a glint of intelligence in your eyes. She gives you a sly wink before turning back to her companions. You likewise turn your attention to the rest of the passengers. Sitting apart from the general crowd are two men in dark, well-tailored suits, whispering quietly to each other. They have un unamused expressions on their faces. I am not amused, as if they don't seem pleased to be here. Perhaps they're on business. Noticing that you're sitting alone, the ferryman approaches you and stands over you with his characteristic smile. You notice he's missing a tooth in the upper left corner of his mouth. Hmm, that could be important. His eyes are bright as they light upon you. Good afternoon. You look a bit lonely there, friend. What brings you to Asbury? If you are creating your own investigator, we would choose our occupation at this po point, okay? We're going to use the rules for that in it. This particular entry just asks you to assign some uh, large skill roles to particular uh, skills that, that you want. You know, it's a simplified version of the character creation rules. If you're playing Dr. Woods instead, all of their skill points have been assigned for you. Yep, and I spent the extra 70. So then there's a list depending upon your particular occupation. We're going to go all the way down to the one on the bottom here. If you are a professor or have chosen to play Dr. Woods, go to 23. So we will do that. Back to 23. You mentioned the passing of a distant colleague in Esbury and, and how you've been sent by Miskatonic to recover his work and bring it back to the university. The man sighs and nods slowly. You mean Professor Harris. Real shame what happened to him. Always seems like such a nice man. Officer Powell says they're still cleaning up the mess at the professor's place. But some of the more valuable bits will probably be at the estate sale tonight. If you're really wanting at it. The man looks down at his hands for a moment and then back at you as he extends one your way. Anyway, I'm Lance. Lance Sanford. Pleased to meet you, but I wish it were under better circumstances, eh? And now we have an opportunity to make a decision. I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to let those of you in the audience decide where we go next in Alone Against the Tide. And you can go ahead and post in the comments what you think we should do. I don't know whether we can do more than one of these things. We might only be able to do one of them. You know, it could be a short ferry trip. And that is something that is common for these solitary adventures. You, you don't have unlimited time to do these things necessarily. And so our choices are, should we inquire? more about Professor Harris. It was messy. Should we inquire about Officer Powell? Uh, should we ask Lance Sanford about himself? Should we ask about the estate sale? Or should we pass the time just waiting to arrive in Esbury and do nothing? Um, I'm telling you right now that I'm not going to choose to do nothing as a go get them investigator. And so, yeah, which of these four choices right here do you think would be best? Go ahead and throw your response into the comments and we'll see what happens there. And we'll pick this up, um, you know, probably not the next video, but a video or two uh, from now so that, you know, we vary the content a little bit on the channel. So thanks for everybody for watching this introduction to Alone Against the Tide. I'm going to go ahead and stick Eleanor Woods here uh, at 23, and I'm going to uh, make a little mark here that we are at entry 23, so we know where to pick up next time. And uh, yeah, check out Alone Against the Tide. And remember, if you purchase from chaosium.com, not only uh, the physical copy, not only would you get a the physical book, but you also get the PDF. Um, 
of the book as well. And so thanks again, Chaosium, for sponsoring this video. And thanks to my patrons for suggesting that I do Alone Against the Tide for the next video. And, you know, as I've mentioned on the channel before, I am set to receive uh, quite a few Kickstarters over the coming weeks in the mail. I think that Starship Warden, which is a very famous campaign for Metamorphosis Alpha, uh, should be arriving here, you know, any time now. Uh, many of those rewards have been shipped. And so, you know, we'll see what shows up on the channel next. But thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great day.